My name is Chris Wright, and we're thinking here about living God's story. What does it mean to live within the story of God in the Bible, but in today's world? So let's get straight into lecture one, reading the whole Bible as the mission of God. Let me begin by asking you a question. What do you think the Bible is? Here's what I think the Bible is not. The Bible is not just a book full of promises, although there are many and they're very nice. The Bible is not just a book full of doctrines, for those who like systematic theology. Uh, the Bible is not just a book full of rules, which are a bit tough, but then obedience is good for the soul. And the Bible is not just a book full of history, uh, some of it pretty ancient history, and what relevance does that have to today's world? Of course, there are all of those things are in the Bible, but they're not what the Bible is in itself. What the Bible actually is, is the great overarching canonical story with a beginning and a middle and an ending. Or better, the Bible is the true story of the whole universe. It begins with creation and it ends with new creation. And in between, it tells the story of humanity in relation to God in sin and in salvation. More important even than that is that the Bible is our story, because this is the story that tells us who we are and why we are here as God's people on earth. This is the story that shapes our whole Christian worldview. This is the story where we meet God in Christ and come to know him. And this is the story that shows us how we are to live as God's people here on earth and gives us the resources to do so. And this is the story then that gives us hope and sends us out in mission. Now, I owe my next point to my good friends Michael Goheen uh, and Craig Bartholomew, who wrote an excellent book that you should get hold of if you can. It's the book called The Drama of Scripture, Finding Our Place in the Biblical Story. And they portray the Bible as a great drama in six acts. And I've taken that idea and expanded it by just one and made it a more perfect seven acts. So the Bible, in other words, is not just a story. It's more like a great drama, an enormous play, as it were, in the theater of the universe with a huge cast of actors who are all playing their part in this vast narrative whose author and director is God himself. And here's the thing, you see, that we are not just spectators of this drama, not, not just an audience in the theater. No, we get to be part of the story. We become actors on the stage playing our part. Indeed, we are called, we are commissioned to join the cast of God's great drama and to play our part in our own generation. We are in the Bible and we look a little bit later at what that means. Now, like most great dramas, the drama of the Bible is divided up into several acts, that is, major sections or stages of the big story in which distinct and significant things take place as the drama moves forward. And we can picture the Bible as a drama in these seven acts like this. Here they are, as it were, all at once. Now, don't panic. Uh, we'll be going through this uh, diagram and pictures one piece at a time in a moment. And these symbols that are on the screen, or at least most of them, I also owe to another friend who I always like to acknowledge. And that is a friend called Chris Gonzalez, who is the leader of the Missio Dei network of churches in Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States. And he once drew pictures like this on the back of an envelope for one of his church members in order to explain how the Bible can be conceptualized as one big single story. Let's look briefly then at these seven acts of the Bible drama and understand how important they are in getting a grasp of the Bible as a whole, as one big story. Let's be clear here, I'm not talking about different dispensations in the dispensational sense of the word. No, I, I'm simply talking about a historical sequence of stages in the whole Bible story. And then when we work through this story, we'll, we'll think a bit later about what happens when you read the whole Bible in this way. How does it affect our lives and our work as Christian believers? How does it impact our mission? So let's look then at that first act, Act 1, Creation. Here it is. The whole drama of Scripture begins when the one living eternal God chooses to create what we call the universe, heaven and earth, and he created it good, and he created human beings in God's own image to rule and to serve within God's good creation. 
this is like this great triangle, a creation triangle of God, the earth, and humanity. And it is the foundation for our whole worldview as Christians. So what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that God is the creator, the one true living God, sovereign over his whole universe. It tells us that we are human beings created by God in the image of God and authorized to rule over the rest of creation, as we read in Genesis chapter 1, but also entrusted to serve and care for the earth, as we read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And then, of course, we read that the earth itself is good because it belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's, as Psalm 24, verse 1 says, and it's been gifted to us. The earth he has given to the sons of men, says Psalm 115, verse 16. So God's intention then is for us to work and rest, to produce and share and trade and engage in all the activities that human life on earth makes possible. That's good. That's what God wants us to be doing. So it's important then at this point to take this first act of the Bible story very seriously because it's the foundation for all the rest. You see, if we don't have a strong grasp of the creation beginning of the story and all that it means for human life and society and culture and work and everything else, then we will not have a good understanding of the goal of the rest of the story with its wonderful ending in the new creation. So let's move on then uh, a little bit further to Act 2 of the Bible story. Here we go. I've put a kind of X mark here to show that everything went wrong. It's our rebellion. We human beings, we chose to distrust God's goodness, to, to disbelieve God's word, and of course to disobey God's instruction. And as a result, everything went wrong, as that crossing out symbol suggests. And so what happens here is that sin and evil entered into every dimension of our human relationships in our lives, spiritual, intellectual, physical, social. You read the story there in Genesis 3, and it's a very simple story, the story of the fall, but it touches all of those dimensions. You see, Eve is tempted, isn't she, to question and to doubt God's truthfulness and God's goodness. So her spiritual relationship with God is poisoned. And then she exercises her capacity for rational thought. She sees that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is good for food, and she appreciates its beauty and desire for wisdom. And all of those are good things in themselves. In fact, they are God-given abilities, but neither being exercised in a direction that God had forbidden. And then she took and she ate physical actions in the physical world. And then she gave it to her husband who was with her. Please notice, you men, her husband was there with her. And so the sin that was already spiritual and intellectual and physical now becomes shared and social as well. And it poisons their relationship with one another as well as with God. And then, of course, Genesis 4 to 11, the, the remaining chapters in that section of the book, show us how sin impacts not just personal and social life, it also grows and escalates through the generations and the centuries of history, and it spreads out to societies and nations and leads to corruption and violence. It infects all cultures and even creates confusion and division among nations, and, of course, has brought damage and frustration to creation itself. So you see, we need to understand the Bible's radical, comprehensive diagnosis of sin and evil. That is, if we're going to appreciate the vast scope of God's plan of redemption, because the problem that's been caused by our sin and rebellion is vast and multifaceted. And that means that the gospel has to be as big as the problem. And the Bible, of course, shows us that, thank God, it is. It's not only that we have a gospel that addresses every aspect of the consequences of sin for us, but we also need to understand that God's mission and the mission that God calls us into must also be broad and comprehensive and address all of those different dimensions of our sin. And so we move on then to our Act 3 of the Bible story. Uh, and here we have it, uh, Act 3, which I present as Old Testament promise. Because it's into this fallen state of divided humanity, living on an earth that is now under God's curse, that God intervenes with this amazing promise and plan that moves the story forward in hope, which is why I portrayed this 
uh, part of the Bible story with the symbol of an arrow pointing forwards. It all begins, of course, in Genesis chapter 12 with God's call and promise to Abraham that not only would he become a great nation, the nation of Old Testament Israel, but that through them God would bring blessing to all the nations on the earth. So uh, at a simple level, really, it, it can be pictured something like this, that within that outer triangle there of God and all the nations and the whole earth, that creational triangle that we saw back at Act 1, which has then become twisted uh, and broken and spoiled by sin, God begins to work redemptively within that in a kind of inner triangle, which I've colored red here, the color of redemption, as it were, because out of all the nations, God creates and calls into existence one nation, the people of Israel, to be the means of bringing blessing to all the rest. It's Israel for the sake of the nation. And then out of all the earth, he gives them one land, which becomes something of a microcosm of God's promised blessing for all the earth. So in many ways, the, the Old Testament is dominated by these triple relationships between God and Israel and the land, as you can see there in the diagram. And yet the whole point is that what God was doing in Old Testament Israel and their land was never, never intended for them alone or just as some piece of ancient history, or perhaps just as a source for good Sunday school stories and sermons. No, God is at work within this part of the Bible story for the sake of all the nations and the whole earth. So you see, that's God's promise. That's the hope that is built into this part of the story. That's the, the driving dynamic of the mission of God ever since Abraham. In fact, you could say that the whole mission of God throughout all of human history is simply God keeping his promise to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you, said God to Abraham. Every tribe and nation and language, says the book of Revelation, when the story is complete and God's mission is accomplished. So then that promise, that hope from Abraham drives the Bible story forward through the history of Israel in the Old Testament era what I've called Act 3 of the biblical story. Of course, it's a very complex part of the story. It's got many twists and turns, in fact, many wrong turns that Israel took. But through it all, God keeps this story on course. He keeps it moving towards the fulfillment of his promise because God always keeps his promise. So the question then is, when will God keep his promise to Abraham about bringing blessing to the nations. So very quickly then, uh, this part of the story we could summarize with what's now on the screen. There's that promise to Abraham, blessing for all nations, but it's a story then proceeds through the Exodus when God delivered the Israelites out of slavery and oppression in Egypt. That Exodus was the greatest act of redemption in the Bible until the cross of Christ. And then there's the story of Mount Sinai when God established his covenant with this nation, gave them his law, all based upon God's saving grace that came first. The obedience to the law was always was a matter of responding to God's saving initiative in the Exodus. Salvation came first, and then obedience. And then there are all the narratives of the, the, the gift of the land, the story of the judges and the kings and the exile to Babylon and the return. And in the midst of all of this, of course, there are the prophets who expose the evils of idolatry and injustice and the abuse of economic and political power. And they assert the international sovereignty of God, holding out the future vision of God's salvation for Israel and for all nations through God's anointed servant king the Messiah who would come. And then alongside that story, of course, we have the Psalms and the wisdom literature. So it, it's a huge library of books, but we need to remember that it's all moving forwards like a great journey based on God's promise and highlighting God's redemption, and God's grace, and above all, God's faithfulness pointing towards its future destination. That's Act 3 of the Bible story. And of course, that then leads us to Act 4. And here we have it. I put it in in this symbol of the cross. It's the gospel story at the very center of the Bible narrative, because that promise of the Old Testament comes to fulfillment when Jesus of Nazareth is born. And so this great central act of the drama of scripture includes all that we read in the four gospels, the conception and birth and life and teaching and atoning death on the cross, and victorious resurrection and ascension of the Messiah, Jesus. So that cross at the center of the diagram stands not just for the actual crucifixion, 
but for that whole earthly life of Christ. And this, of course, is the heartbeat of the whole Bible drama. Acts 1, 2, and 3 have pointed towards this, what God accomplished in Act 4. And then what we will see in a moment is Acts 5, 6, and 7 all follow from here. Well, once again, all we can do is to, to try to summarize some aspects uh, of, of this part of the, of the story, the central Act 4. The obvious, most obvious one is the incarnation, that the God of Israel of the Old Testament becomes a human being. The Word became flesh, as John put it, and God lived and walked among us as a human being. And then in that human life of Jesus, he proclaimed the kingdom of God. Jesus announces that God has become king in a, in a new and real way through himself, through his power. It, it's a whole new beginning for a new world. Although, as he said, it, it's happening in hidden ways. It is a fact. God reigns. And it is a challenge. Come and live within the kingdom of God. And, of course, it is also a hope because we pray that God's kingdom will fully come uh, when Christ returns. And then in the Gospels, of course, not only the teaching of the kingdom of God, but Jesus' own life and example. He showed us what it looks like to live as citizens of God's kingdom, very differently from the world around us. And then, of course, at the very center, the cross and the resurrection, the victory of Christ's atoning death and triumphant resurrection. And this is, yes, at the very center of the Bible's good news, the gospel, that God has dealt with evil and sin and death by suffering their consequences. God takes them into himself. He bears them in the person of God's own son, and he robs them of their power, and he assures us of their ultimate destruction. And then there is the ascension and the present reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is seated at the right hand of God, which means that he's in the place of cosmic government of all the nations and of all history. Jesus is Lord. Act four of the Bible story. That takes us on then to Act five. Here we have it. I have called it New Testament mission. You see, because the promise that God made to Abraham must be fulfilled. And what God promised was that all nations would be blessed through him. So the good news of what God has accomplished through his son Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, that must now go to all the nations. And that, of course, is what gets launched at the end of the Gospels and then again at the beginning of the book of Acts, after the outpouring of the, the Spirit of God upon the followers of Jesus on that marvelous day of Pentecost. The Bible story goes on through the rest of the New Testament and still today. And so, uh, again, to, to, to summarize this part of the story, with that mission of the apostles to the Gentile, then God's promise to Abraham begins to be fulfilled in ways that go way beyond the, the individual outsiders who came to faith in the God of Israel in the Old Testament. You know, people like Jethro and Ruth and Naaman and a few others. Now it's multitudes, multitudes from many nations who are included within the expanded people of God in Christ, in the Messiah Jesus. And so the New Testament church becomes a multinational community in Christ and is indeed the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise and prophecy, as Paul makes very clear in Romans and Galatians. Because like Old Testament Israel, we, we who are believers in Jesus, are called to live as God's people in the midst of the nations. But more than them, we are commanded to go to all the nations with the good news of what God has done through Christ. And so mission becomes centrifugal, going out to the ends of the world. So that mission then of the New Testament church generates the documents of our New Testament. Those letters of Paul and Peter and James and John, they were all written to shape the churches, to give them a sense of identity and mission, to be, as we might say, fit for purpose. God's purpose, God's mission. And you see, here's the thing that we now continue to participate in this part of the story in obedience to the Great Commission and all that Jesus taught us to be and to do in the world for him. We live in Act 5 of the Bible story, in between the resurrection of Christ and the return of Christ. And we think a little bit more about what that means in a moment. And so coming back then uh, to our, our diagram, uh, we need to move on. Uh, here we've seen all these first, uh, first five acts, and that brings us to Acts 6, 
of the Bible story, which is the final judgment. This is the penultimate act in the grand drama of Scripture. That is, it's not the last one, but it's one before the last. There is a wonderful ending still to come, but before it comes, there is the judgment. And so I think it does need to be placed here as a distinct act within the great Bible story, because it comes before that final great resolution of the story in the new creation. It's the necessary prelude, preparation for that great restoration and new beginning that we read at the end of the book of Revelation. And indeed, it is, in fact, the last judgment, an essential part of the gospel which may be hard to take in, but it is. It is, in fact, good news. Because, you see, the good news is that evil and Satan will not have the last word. They will finally be utterly destroyed out of God's creation. And also in God's ultimate judgment and justice, those who have aligned themselves with Satan and with evil and refused to repent and turn back to God will face the eternal consequences of their own sin and their own choice and their rejection of God. Evildoers will not, as they sometimes, as we sometimes say, get away with it forever. No, says God, justice will be done. Not just our human, flawed, partial, provisional human justice, but the perfect, indisputable, and irreversible justice of God. So God will ultimately deal with all wrongs and will put all things right, because that's actually what judgment means in the Bible. It means God putting things right, as the psalmist celebrates at the end of Psalm 96, where we hear all of creation is rejoicing because God is coming to judge the earth, which means to put things right. It's the final rectification and all wrongs will be put right by the judge of all the earth. So Act 6 then, this final judgment is, it's not just something negative. As I said, it's actually an essential part of the gospel, because it is good news that God will totally defeat and eradicate all evil. Because you see, if that were not so, then the universe would remain a moral chaos with, with no ultimate meaning. But no, we have this certainty of final judgment, which gives us hope because we know that God will put all things right. That is hope for the lost, the oppressed, the violated, the wrong, the martyred, hope even for creation itself, as Paul puts it in Romans 8. And so we come then to our final act in the biblical drama. Here we have it, and it is nothing less than the new creation, Act 7. The final great act of the drama is when Christ returns to establish his kingdom. And then there will be the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, as we've just seen, and the purging and the renewal of the whole creation. And, and that's why my final symbol here on the screen is once again this creational triangle of God, humanity, and creation, but in the glory of ultimate redemption and restoration. And you see, that's what the Bible means by hope. It's not just a vague, wishful thinking, oh, I hope it's going to be better next year than this year. No, this is, this is the certainty of what God will do to bring this great story of the Bible, this great drama of the Bible to its climax and conclusion. Revelation chapter 21 and 22 tells us that God will create a new heaven and a new earth. It's actually first promised back in Isaiah chapter 65. Now, this doesn't mean the complete obliteration of all our present universe, but rather the purging, the cleansing, the renewal and restoration of creation to all that God intended it to be. Not a replacement earth, but a renewed earth. You see, contrary to much popular Christian imagination and a lot of hymns and songs that talk this way, the Bible does not end with us going up to heaven, the Bible ends with God and heaven coming down to earth, so that once again, says the Bible, God will dwell in the midst of his redeemed people from all nations. That's the repeated message there in Revelation chapter 21. Just look at the first five verses of that chapter, where three times we read that God will dwell with us, with his people. In some ways, this is the ultimate Emmanuel promise, God with us. Not us going to be somewhere else with God, but God coming to be with us forever. 
that's the end of the great Bible story. And of course, it, it isn't really the end. It's, it's the end of the Bible, but it's also a new beginning because after putting all things right, God promises that he will make all things new. So what we ought to be asking is not when is this all going to happen and then trying to work out dates and times and so on, which actually Jesus told us not to do, but rather the question is, are we ready day by day? for that return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we prepared for it as he warned us to be? And also, what kind of life should we be living now as we participate in this present Act 5 of the Bible story in preparation for that ultimate Acts 7? So there we have it, this great drama of the Bible, one big story, a grand narrative that embraces the whole canon of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation and all its different blocks and kinds of literature that is in there. I think actually that this is what the Apostle Paul meant when he talked to the elders of the churches in Ephesus about having taught them the whole counsel of God in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, the whole plan and purpose and will of God, as he refers to in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, this is what's meant by the mission of God. It's this great eternal purpose of God that is driving the whole drama of Scripture forward to this glorious ultimate goal. But what happens when we read the Bible this way, when we really make an effort to see every book and every passage and every part of the scripture in its proper place within this great overarching narrative of God from creation through to new creation. What does this way of reading the Bible do for us? Well, I want to suggest several things. Uh, and here we go then with the first one. What does this do? Well, first of all, it shows us how we got our Bible as the product of God's own mission. You see, these documents that we have in our Bible, they arose out of God's engagement in history through God's own people. The Bible is the story of God's mission. It's not just the record of it, in a sense, it's also the product of it. We have our Bibles because God has been doing what God planned and promised in the Bible itself. And then God made sure that people wrote these things down so that his plans and his purposes and his accomplishments would be remembered and known and learned and taught and shared all through the generation. So you see, the very existence of the Bible in the amazing form that we have it is proof of God's mission through history and right on into eternity. It's the guarantee of our future eternal hope. And here's the second thing, that reading the Bible in this way as a great narrative story shapes our worldview. You may wonder, well, what is a worldview? Well, worldviews are the lenses through which we human beings see the world around us, make sense of it, and then adjust our lives accordingly. And every religion, every culture, every society, everybody really, share some worldview or another, which may or may not be compatible with those that are actually there in the Bible. In essence, every worldview consists of the kind of answers that people give to some basic questions, like, where are we? What is this world that we live in? Who are we? What does it mean to be human? What's gone wrong? Why is the world in such a mess? And what's the solution? What can be done about the mess in the world? And how should we then be living in the light of all that? Well, you see, a truly Christian worldview answers all of those questions out of the story of the Bible. Where are we? We are on the earth that was created by God in Act 1 of the Bible story. It's not just an object. It's not just stuff and matter that we can use or abuse as we want. No, it belongs to God. And that worldview of the Bible, of the, uh, our world as created, affects our economics, our ecology, and everything we do on the earth and to the earth. And who are we? Well, act one, still, we are creatures made in the image of God with all the delegated authority and responsibility within creation that gives us. We are morally and spiritually accountable to our creator. So what's gone wrong then? Well, act three, act two, rather, of the Bible narrative, we chose to rebel against our creator and to decide for ourselves what is good and evil and right and wrong. And look at the mess we've made of it. 
the world is in a mess because of human sin and folly and in collusion with satanic rebellion and evil also. And so if that's the problem, what's the solution? Well, there isn't one, not from our side. We can't solve the world's big problems by ourselves, which is pretty obvious, but God can and God has done in the great biblical story of salvation, promised and accomplished in Christ and ultimately to be completed in the guaranteed future in Acts 6 and 7. So how should we then live? Well, we should live by turning back to God in repentance and gratitude and faith and obedience to live in God's ways and by God's values and standards. And we do that in response to all that God has done for us in Christ in Acts 1 to 4 and in anticipation of all that God will complete when Christ returns in Acts 6 and 7. So can you see then how the whole Bible story as a whole shapes and informs our fundamental assumptions and our understanding of life, the universe, and everything. This biblical story, it gives a coherent account of reality, explains the past, and gives us grounds for hope for the future. And the whole Christian faith, including our own core Christian doctrines, flow from this grand narrative and scripture, and really only make sense within it and in the light of its truth. So coming back then uh, to my third point, that this reading the Bible in this way as the great narrative of God, it puts us into the story as participants in the story itself. We are actors in act five of the drama of scripture. That's where we are, as I said, somewhere between the resurrection of Christ and the return of Christ. So if we go back to that diagram, where do we find ourselves? Well, just here, somewhere in act five, that's our place our place within history. We have a role, we have a part to play. We have a mission to accomplish with God and for God. Because you see, this Bible story is our story. We are in the Bible. So that means you see that the Bible is not just the object of our study. It's not just something out there separate from us. No, it's the story we are in. It's the drama we are acting in. It's, it's the real world that we're called upon to inhabit. So the question that we need to ask ourselves again and again, really, is what story am I living in? Am I living just in the world's story or in God's story? Now, of course, we do have to live in the world. We, we can't yet go anywhere else. Uh, we live in the world, but we don't live by the story that the world likes to tell. We live by the story that God has given us. That's where we belong. We're in the world, but as Jesus put it, not of the world. The world doesn't own us. We live by God's story. And so stepping back for a moment uh, to this same point, putting us into God's story like this means that we don't just apply the Bible to ourselves. You know, we, we, we read a Bible verse and we say, how does this apply to my life? As if somehow my life was at the very center of reality. But rather I ask, how can I apply my life into the Bible? That we should be constantly orientating our lives and with this thought, where and how does my life, my little life that's been given to me by God, and has been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, this life that I'm living right now with all its choices and decisions and opportunities and challenges, how does this life of mine fit into God's story, God's story in the Bible with all its truth and its explanations of the past, its hope for the future, all its warnings, all its demands, all its commands, all its teaching, how does my life fit into that story? How should I then live? And that leads me then to our fourth point, which is that it challenges us to live the story we are in. When you think of the Apostle Paul and his teaching of his churches, it seems that he constantly wanted them not only to know the story they were in, but to live in it. He planted churches, didn't he? Small communities of believers in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, small communities of Christians in the midst of this colossal overpowering Roman Empire with all its gods and its dazzling imperial ideology and so on. And so they, these Christians, they needed to know 
their true identity. They needed to know the story they were in. They needed to know who they belonged to and then to live that story out in, 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 in their lives. So look what he prays for here, for the, these Christians in Colossae, a, a Roman city full of gods and temples and the worship of the emperor himself. Well, if you read Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, he prays for them, first of all, to know God's story. He says, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Uh, by the will of God, Paul meant the plan of God, not personal guidance for our lives, but God's plan and purpose for the whole creation and of human history. Paul wants all believers to know the biblical story of the mission and purposes of God. And when you read his letters, like Galatians and Ephesians, you can see that Paul must have taught these Gentile believers a great deal of the scriptures, meaning, of course, the Old Testament scriptures, to help them to understand the story they were in. They needed to know it and to grow in it and to have knowledge of it. And so do we. And how much easier it is for us, because we've got the whole of our Bibles to study and read. But then the second thing in verse 10, he also wants them to live by God's standards. He says, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. See, this is, this is practical stuff. There's a life to be lived as well as truth to be believed and teaching to be understood. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we letting the whole Bible shape our thinking and our choices and our relationships and our words that we speak or that we write, our day-to-day -day behavior, our work, our use of our money, our political opinions and convictions, and so on and so on? Are they all being shaped by living within the Bible story for ourselves? And then thirdly, Paul's third prayer is that he wants them to prove God's strength, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, he says there in verse 11. They would need endurance in order to stand firm under suffering and persecution, which you may well be facing. I don't know. But the question is, are we strengthening our faith and our endurance in a hostile world by daily feeding ourselves upon the word of God. And so that brings me then finally to our fifth point, that reading the Bible in this way, this holistic whole Bible story way, it also sends us out to play our part in the mission of God. You see, this whole Bible story, as I've said, constitutes the amazing, vast, comprehensive mission of God. It embraces all history, all nations, all creation in and through Christ. And so we are called to participate in that with an integrated understanding of mission in all its dimensions. You see, there are, there are many things that are included in the broad and holistic mission of the church. But what is most important is that they are all centered on and held together by the centrality of the gospel. That is the good news of the kingdom of God and the Lordship of Christ. So the integrating center of the Bible story, the gospel story, must also be the integrating center of our mission. And we're going to be looking and thinking about that uh, in a later lecture. But for the moment, I hope this has helped us at least to begin to think, how can I read the whole Bible from beginning to end, from creation to new creation, as this great overarching story of the mission of God centered in the Lord Jesus Christ, into which God calls me us to participate until Christ returns again. Good evening, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Reverend Dr. Chris Wright. Now, as we wait for the more questions to come in and to keep coming, uh, I just wanted to pick up from the last couple of points, uh, Reverend Chris, uh, that we are in God's story, uh, where we are a participant to live the story we are in, to be sent out. And I think what you were highlighting to us is that, you know, we tend to ask ourselves the question, what is my purpose? What is my mission? What is my calling to make my life count? And you know, there's so many assessment tools, coaching and mentoring movements that help us to define this question. But with your lecture this evening, what you did was to actually 
invert the whole thing and reorganize how we think about life, that we have to ask first, what is God's mission? What is God's purpose and God's master plan? And how do we fit into this? Now, before we get into how do we get around doing that, now, why do you think this priority is so important and what difference would it make if we were to live having in mind God's mission? Thank you, Debbie. Uh, can you hear me? If you could just give a thumbs up so that I know that uh, you're hearing me. Good. Thank you. Yes, that is a good question. Thank you. I, I, the more I've reflected on it, I think the more it helps me to see that if I am a believer in Jesus Christ, if I have come to submit to Jesus as Lord, then I need to recognize that he is Lord of the whole of creation and of all of human history, the past, the present and the future. And that therefore, it's not a question of me, as it were, making Jesus relevant to my needs, get my sins forgiven and go to heaven. But that Jesus says, are you going to come and follow me? Are you going to be part of my program? Are you going to get with the agenda that I have for the world? And once you begin to realize that question, it, it really challenges the way we think about our own lives. Uh, it, first of all, it gives them a significance. It means I'm not just a, a bit of physical matter floating around in the universe with no purpose at all. I do have a purpose, but it's a purpose that doesn't, it's not something I have to create for myself. Uh, part of the problem of so much recent human life and thinking is that we have to almost invent ourselves uh, to, to give ourselves meaning. God says, no, I created you. I will give you meaning if you will come and fit in with what I'm doing for the world. But that affects, you see, not just that then I've got to say, well, so the only thing I have to do, as it were, is to go out and get engaged in some sort of ministry um, narrowly defined as church work uh, or pastoral work or evangelistic work or missionary work or something like that but no whatever God created me to be with all the gifts he's given me and the education and the training and the family and the background what will it mean for me to put all of that into God's mm. hands and say let me serve you God mm. through all that I am and have and can do in the world so that Paul can mm. say even to a slave in the Roman Empire who is a Christian believer to remember that in serving their master, he says, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Uh, they didn't have to go off and be missionaries. They could serve Christ even in the everyday slog and work of their ministry. So I, I think it does reorientate us. We can use all the tools. We can evaluate our gifts. We can get our qualifications. We can follow our dream. But the question is, are we putting it under the Lordship of Christ and into the service of God for his purposes, whatever it may bring to us? Thank you for that. And uh, I think knowing the biblical narrative uh, tells us that, you know, God's will is not a vague uh, thing that we just leave to God, you know, whatever it may be but it's actually something more defined, more specific. So thank you for that. All right, we'll now go to our the questions on the VVOX. Um, this is a very interesting question right on top. Uh, and I think the, the top two questions are actually, I think um, people struggling to live, you know, uh, in the acts, you know, the acts sound, you know, wonderful. It is, you know, they're full of God's promise. But I think the first question says, if the kingdom of God is expanding to all nations ever since Pentecost, is it true that these relationships are progressively being restored? Is there a simultaneous restoration? And, and this question says, you know, I really want that to be true, that as God's kingdom is expanding, there is a restoration, but it doesn't seem to be that way. Why, why, why not? Thank you. That's a, that's a good question. And uh, it's really set me thinking. I think the to begin to answer it, we really need to go back to Jesus and especially to some of his teachings about the kingdom of God, because uh, you remember that he people were expecting that when the kingdom of God would arrive, as it were, everything would happen at once. Uh, all the Romans would be driven out. Uh, the Jewish people would become top nation. Uh, the end of the all, all of that would happen and obviously it didn't 
And some of Jesus' parables make it clear that, first of all, that the kingdom of God will come sometimes in hidden ways. Uh, it will often come in small ways, like mustard seed that will grow and, and progress. Uh, he says it is something that is very precious that you will need to give everything to belong to. So he's, he's expressing ways in which the, the idea of the reign of God within human history has an element that is mysterious, but also dynamic and powerful and at work, even if it's at work in ways that we can't always immediately see. Uh, so part of the answer to the question is um, that, yes, I do believe that all that happens within history in these relationships between God and the church and the world and politics and society, it is all somehow under the sovereignty of God and at different ways and levels is accomplishing the purposes of God. So there is a progression going through history in which God is at work fulfilling his purposes. However, to the second part of the question, one of Jesus' parables was, do you remember, the one about the wheat and the weeds? And he pointed out that, yes, when the farmer sows the good seed in the soil, yes, the wheat will grow. But, he says, what the observers suddenly see in the field, that there are weeds growing as well, mm -hmm. um, which, have, as he says, have been sown by the evil one, by the devil. And so the disciples said, shall we go in and separate them all? Do we need to get this sorted out? And Jesus says, no, no, they will grow together mm -hmm. until ultimately it is God himself who will exercise his discernment and his judgment as to what is of the wheat and what is fundamentally a weed that can be destroyed. And only God can do that. And that does two things. First of all, it it prevents us imagining that somehow we are going to bring in the kingdom of God, that we can make everything right in the end. We can get it sorted. Mm -hmm. there, there's something deeply arrogant about that assumption that somehow Christian mission is God sitting up in heaven waiting until we get the job finished. <laughs> you know, that, 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 it's, <laughs> that God is, as it were, wondering, when will they ever finish the job? Well, it isn't ours to finish in that sense. It is God's plan and God's mission, and we participate in it, uh, and God will bring it to completion at the end. But secondly, it warns us that things may well get progressively both better and worse simultaneously. Um, and when, you, when we look at our world and the course of human history, I would say that is true. There is a sense in which I'm very glad to be living in the 21st century and not in the 15th or 16th or even the 18th century, because so much about our world is so much better. Yet we have this pandemic at the moment. Uh, well, they had plagues in the past, but they didn't have vaccines within a year. You know, th there are ways in which... Uh, the progress of human civilization and human science and all the gifts that God has given us in creation, we have been able to use those in ways that have made life better, better sanitation, better health, all kinds of ways in which it's better today than it was. And yet at the same time, we look at our world and we see the horrors uh, of, of evil and suffering and oppression and violence and the attack upon truth uh, and all the satanic elements in our world. And we would have to say that in many ways, there are aspects of the world we live in today which seem to be worse than it was a uh, 100 years ago. And I think Jesus would say, well, I told you so. <laughs> the wheat and the weeds will grow mm -hmm. together, uh, and God is at work within these. They, they, uh, it, it's not just hand in hand. It's not just you know, equivalence. But we need to be aware that it is a confusing world, and it's the world of Ecclesiastes, the world of Habakkuk, the world in which so much is baffling and mm -hmm. we don't understand, and so much is violent and we wish it was different. But we have to have this faith that Habakkuk says that the righteous person, the person who is in a right relationship with God, will live by their faith, their faith and their faithfulness to God. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, an, an answer to that very perceptive first question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The second question is uh, somewhat related uh, to that. I think there's a similar, um, uh, you know, the, the question of why suffering and injustice, perhaps for the second question, um, Dr. Wright, you might want to comment on Act 6, since you comment, commented on Act 5. So the second question basically says, 
um, that this person uh, and the people that upvoted uh, them, why does Act 7 not directly follow Act 5? Why do we have to go through Act sorry, Act 4, why do we have to go through this suffering and injustice Act 5 and Act 6? So, yeah, I think it's related mm. to the first. Maybe you could just... Mm. Yes, it is. Thank you. Again, uh, it's, it's great to see these questions inspired by uh, that, that diagram and that idea. Basically, what it's saying is, in a sense, why didn't Jesus just come back and bring in the new creation a few days after his resurrection? Wouldn't it have saved an awful lot of time? But equally, one could ask the question, why did God not just send Jesus, Act 4, straight after Act 2? <laughs> in other words, after Adam and Eve fell into sin, why doesn't God say, okay, I'll send Jesus and sort that out right away? Um, in other words, why do we get Act 3, this great long story of the Old Testament, you know, mm -hmm. 1,500, 2,000 years, whatever it is, between the fall and the coming of Christ? And why do we get this great long Act 5, the mission of the church, between the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Christ. And there is part of me which, part of me which wants to say, really, you've got to ask God that question. <laughs> it's not for me to say, because ultimately uh, only God is in control of history. But I think the other part of me wants to say, we actually do believe in the God who takes history seriously. God actually is dealing with the human race and with the nations of the human race in a way which genuinely respects our humanity, uh, our choices, our politics, our international relationships. And God is the God who, who wants there to be people of every tribe and nation on earth to be participating in his new creation. Um, and I suppose that's one reason why the story of the Old Testament allows so much time for the multiplication of nations and tribes and languages and so on. This great diversity of humanity that was part of God's intention. Uh, the, the story of the Tower of Babel is not saying that uh, multiple languages and, and multiple diversity of cultures are somehow evil. It's saying that because of our arrogance and sin, it has become the cause of division and confusion. Uh, not the diversity itself. And similarly, in the New Testament era, it, it seems that God is wanting that the gospel, the good news of what he's accomplished in through Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, he wants that good news to go to all the nations, including nations that they didn't even know existed in New Testament times. I mean, mm -hmm. In the world of the Bible at that time, nobody knew even of the existence of the continents of the Americas, uh, or of Australia, New Zealand, or the Pacific Islands, and so on. There were vast amounts of human beings living on this planet whom God knew about, whom God loved, whom Jesus died for, but who were not yet known to those whom he entrusted the task of mission. So I think that's part of the answer. And the only other thing I can think of in answer to that is the, the answer that Peter gives in 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, where he, he's facing those who are saying, well, when is the second coming going to happen? Why hasn't mm -hmm. it happened? Why isn't, you know, if it mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet, it's never going to happen at all. And there's this impatience. Mm -hmm. um, and Peter says, well, do remember that with God, a thousand years is as one day. So we're dealing with God's clock, not with our clock. God doesn't operate according to our calendars. But secondly, he says, God is being patient, wanting everyone to come to repentance so that part of the reason i think again for the long era of old testament history and the long eras of new testament history that we're still in is the patience of god and the desire for god to populate his new creation as it were uh, with a great multitude whom no one can number from every tribe and nation and language i think that's perhaps the best way i can answer that second question thank you so much just a reminder for everybody to keep the questions coming. We have, I think, until 9.30. So I think uh, we have time for a few more. Um, I think just as, as a thought, since we are talking about the different acts, I think something that was uh, very interesting about your presentation, uh, Dr. Chris, is that um, we hardly think of the final judgment as good news. We hardly think of the day Jesus comes back and being called to the throne 
as setting things right. Uh, it's we, we often think of it as, oh dear, you know, some of us are good. It's going to be bad news for some of us and mostly we, we focus on that. Could you tell us, um, unpack that a little bit more? And, you know, in, in the New Testament letters even, um, when Christians in the early church were encouraged to do good, it was in the context of the future hope that Jesus was coming back. Could you just unpack the good news that is found in Act 6 and how we could see this in light of today? Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, just by way of pre preliminary, let's remember that Paul does say in Romans, I think it's in Romans 1 and maybe in chapter 2, that he talks about the God who will judge all people according to their works as according to my gospel, he says. In other words, for Paul, uh, the, the ultimate judgment of God was an element of the good news, the gospel he preached. And I think partly in order to answer this, we do have to go back to the whole of the scriptures and back to the Old Testament and realize that when the Israelites began to understand the nature of the God who had revealed himself to them uh, in the books of Genesis, right through Exodus and Deuteronomy, that the God of Israel, the, the Lord God, he is the God who reveals himself as both the God of compassion and mercy and love. Uh, that's who he says he is in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, the Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love, but who will not acquit the guilty. Uh, he is the God of ultimate justice as well. Uh, he is the God who resists wrongdoing and evil and who will ultimately not have it as part of his creation. Mm -hmm. uh, that is good. It is good that we live in a world which is not as the polytheists believe, as the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians believe, a world that is just at the mercy, as it were, of good and evil forces in competition and who knows who will win. Uh, that at the end of the day, we can never be sure whether reality is against us or for us. We live in a, that, that view as an uncertain, hopeless environment in which there can be no certainty whether you're pleasing this God and angering that God or whether any God will ever get things sorted out. All you can do is just hope for the best and mm. probably it'd be better to commit suicide because you really don't know what's going to happen. You get that feeling very much in the ancient Near Eastern documents around the same time as the Old Testament. But mm. here is the God who says, look, there is this evil reality of the world. There are those who are allied with it, but I am going to sort it out. And at the end of the day, those who choose to do wicked, to oppress, to hurt, to rob, to steal, to destroy, to kill, they will not get away with it forever. He is the God who will mm -hmm. do justice. Uh, and that, that principle that somehow or other, uh, evil must be dealt with and destroyed and paid for, as it were, is at the very heart of God's moral universe. Uh, that mm. I think is very much part of the Old Testament teaching. But you see what the New Testament then adds is that mm. God could do that because God knew, and this is the very heart of God from before all eternity, from in all eternity before time, that God knew that in order to do that, he would have to do it himself uh, and that he would choose to bear into himself all evil and uh, uh, the, the, the evil that is done, which he chooses to do at the cross through mm. the person of the Son of God. So God in the person of the Son and doing it through the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, because all three of the Trinity are involved in atonement, God chooses to deal with evil by absorbing it into himself in the sense substituting himself for what we should suffer. Uh, and that is where, therefore, the, the judgment of God is the judgment borne by Christ, but then also, as it were, still remaining for those who uh, choose to align themselves with evil, who never come to repentance, who never submit to the reign of God in Christ, uh, that God will still put things ultimately right. Mm. And so the final judgment is, as I use this word in my talk, it is the final rectification it's God dealing with wrong and evil and God putting things right mm -hmm. so that the world, as it were, can be recalibrated and restored mm -hmm. and begin in the new creation 
as a place in which evil will have no more foothold uh, because it will have been utterly destroyed. Uh, that's why Act mm -hmm. 6 is also part of the good news because it's an essential precursor to mm -hmm. Act 7. Mm -hmm. I hope that uh, answers the question, but I'm not sure entirely it does, but at, at the moment it's the best I can do. But we need to we need to get a hold of the whole Bible story, you see, mm -hmm. of understanding what the judgment of God means and why it actually matters. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. All right, the next question. Uh, this person, uh, and quite a number of people agree with this uh, question. In the white Christian Australian context, the idea of our relationship with creation needing to be restored is new. Normally, we think in terms of saving souls as, you know, uh, a gospel work. So um, he asks, or she asks, is the shifting, uh, this idea of restoring our relationship with creation you know, it's becoming more normalized these days. You know, before this, how did we miss this in scripture before? Or are we just rereading scripture to suit the current values in our dominant culture? Thank you, uh, white Christian Australian. Uh, good to have you with us. Um, and of course, I'm a white Christian Irishman uh, and so on, understand something of the, the background from which that's coming. At the very starting at the very end of the comment, it could well be that for some of us, we are rereading the scripture in the light of a current concern which everybody in the world is facing. But I would want to say, what's wrong with that? Now, of course, it is wrong if we shift the scripture or change the scripture in some way to fit in with current culture, that we submit the scripture to the culture, then that manifestly is wrong. But let's remember that God is the God of all humanity. God is the God of all nations. God is the God who can speak to us as Christians, not just through our conscience and through the scripture and through the Holy Spirit, but sometimes also through the world we live in. Uh, God in the Bible can speak uh, through a slave, can speak to Pharaoh, can speak through uh, a Nebuchadnezzar. God is capable of communicating with us also. Uh, from the world in which we live, even from creation itself. So yes, there is an urgent issue in our world today. The, the ecological crisis, the climate crisis, these things are real. Let's, let's not, you know, let's not engage in the kind of denials that are still sadly popular in some people. Let's assume these things are real. They come to us as warnings. They come to us as God saying, look, pay attention. This is my creation. This is my world. And, and the messing with God's creation will ultimately fight back. I think there's even an element of that in the current pandemic, that part of the cause of that has been human folly and human predation uh, in, the, in the natural habitat, which has made uh, this jumping of a, of, of a virus from uh, animal species to the human species uh, much more likely to happen, and indeed more likely to happen again. That's the scary thing. So if, this, if these are warnings to us from creation, then, you know, again, the prophets used that. Sometimes they said what happened in creation was God's way of warning his people. But coming back again, how do we miss it? Well, partly we missed all of this simply because within the uh, evangelical Christian community, from about the end of the, of the 19th and into the early 20th century, there was indeed a reaction against a kind of liberal Christianity which wanted to reduce the Bible and to reduce the gospel to nothing more than a social message, the so-called social mm -hmm. gospel. Uh, and that it was a, a reaction against that kind of liberalism in which people were saying all we need is better education or better health care or more employment or more justice in the world. Once we can get these human things right, then we will be doing the kingdom of God. Uh, these things are the equivalent of the gospel. Now, evangelicals rightly reacted against that and said, look, you are leaving out essential elements of the gospel, such as the necessity of the atonement, the work of the cross, the essential nature of repentance and forgiveness and the need for eternal life. These are things which we can't ignore. So they brought them back, as it were, into the heart of their message. But the trouble was that they then, at the same time, overlooked aspects of evangelical commitment, which was certainly there in the 19th century, uh, of the necessity of the gospel being embodied 
in the community, in social life, affecting the world of politics and economics and society, which was very strong in the evangelical movement of the late 18th and the mid 19th century. What has been happening, and I notice that someone has been talking about the Lausanne movement and the Cape Town commitment and so on. What has been happening since the middle of the 20th century and on into this, this now is that evangelicals have begun, as it were, to realize that these things need to be held together, but held together around the centrality of the cross and the gospel. Um, and I want to come to that. We will come to that in my third lecture uh, tomorrow. Uh, this, this integrating nature of the gospel. Uh, and within that integration, I would certainly include uh, creation itself. Creation as the world of our work and our engagement, because we, we are in creation, we are part of creation, and creation as also our responsibility, that we were not only to exercise authority and rule, but to exercise care and keeping, according to uh, Genesis 2, verse 15. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is right, in my view, that the creational element of our mission uh, is being brought back into a deeper and greater awareness uh, among uh, Christians in our world today. I think that's absolutely right, and I think it is thoroughly biblical, uh, and it has been missing from a great deal uh, of certainly evangelical preaching and teaching and mission for quite some time, and I believe it's right that it comes back. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. Uh, this person uh, had a conversation with a friend uh, who uh, says that, you know, since God is all knowing and all powerful, uh, God does not need us to do every, anything, you know, that we are not called to go against anything because we are not of this world anyway. And God has got everything planned. Everything is within God's plan. So I think um, this person was having this conversation with someone who thinks that, you know, everything is predetermined. So, he feels that this seems incredibly passive and by extension, therefore, genocide is not something we should address because it is all part of God's plan. Uh, what is your opinion on this mode of thinking and how would you respond to this? Well, yeah, that's a sad opinion. I, it, it almost sounds to me a kind of uh, almost a more Islamic view of life and everything than a biblical one. Uh, the, the biblical teaching that God is sovereign does not mean anywhere that human beings simply sit back and do nothing because you say, well, God will do everything. Uh, because clearly in the Old Testament, certainly God expected his people under his sovereignty and living within him as their covenant Lord to be doing justice, exercising justice, caring for the widow and orphan, defending the rights of the needy and the poor and the exploited, uh, being um, committed to all those aspects of the character of God. Similarly, in the New Testament, Jesus talks about being peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers. He talks about being salt and light, that your good works will, will, will be seen among men. Paul talks repeatedly about being doers of good, uh, he uses several technical words in Greek to express what we would now call about being benefactors. That's simply the Latin version uh, of what he says in Greek. And he seems to have the idea that when Christians are visibly doing good in society, it will commend itself to outsiders. It will have, in a sense, evangelistic benefit. So the whole Bible is filled with this combination of the assumption that God is sovereign. God calls us to be active and participating in what he's doing in the world. But the sovereignty of God does two things. One, it motivates us because we know even when we fail to accomplish what we think we should accomplish, God is still sovereign. God is still working out his purpose. But secondly, it keeps us humble because we realize that at the end of the day, it's not us who are going to as it were, accomplish the kingdom of God, that's God's work. But we are called to be faithful in what we do do and trust God to bring about the ultimate results. So I, I fear that this idea that if God is all knowing and um, all powerful and all sovereign, then we don't need to be advocating for the poor or active in the political or the social or economic realm, just doesn't stand up mm -hmm. in terms of the way the Bible describes the responsibility of being wow. God's people in the world whether we're talking about Old Testament Israel 
or the New Testament church? Yes, and actually, uh, Reverend Wright actually does address this in tomorrow's uh, second session. Uh, so do come back for that. You know, talks about how is God sovereign in our in, in a secular world. Okay, so there'll be more tomorrow. So hang on to that question further, and uh, Reverend Wright will deal a bit of that further tomorrow. This uh, the next concern is this question that uh, if almost all the songs that we sing in my church. Uh, are upbeat, victorious, focus on my relationship with God, you know, all things are possible, we are triumphant, and so on and so forth. How do you think that would impact the way the church engages uh, with a broken world and therefore a broken earth? Mm. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad someone has noticed that. Um, <laughs> it, it really does disturb me that the first thing I would say is that church might well think it's being terribly biblical because they're always singing the praises of God. Thank goodness we should and can do that. Of course we should praise God for his victory and uh, for his relationship with God and so on. But it's certainly not true to the Bible in terms of what God has given us in the book of Psalms. If the book of Psalms was essentially, as it were, the worship book for the worship leaders of Israel, then it's an astonishing fact that in a book which is called The Praises, because that's what the book is called in Hebrew, that the largest single category of the praises are actually protests. They're laments. They're engaging with the brokenness and the evil and the suffering of the world. They're complaining about it. They're angry about it. They're throwing it up to God and say, God, when are you going to do something about this? That may sometimes be personal. Lord, I'm suffering here uh, and, and I'm in agony and pain because of what other people are doing and saying to me and you're not helping me. And so it's a personal lament. But sometimes uh, it is much more of a political lament. Look at Psalm, Psalm 10 or Psalm 94. And the psalmist is saying, Lord, the, the, the evil and the wicked people, they're getting away with it. They're crushing the poor. They're doing evil. Why aren't you stopping it, God? And, and they complain. Now, when do we ever do that in church? Why don't we? Uh, I, I think we ought to. Um, certainly, I feel that sometimes when, when terrible things happen in the world, I, I remember this just going back now quite a number of years ago to the tsunami in the Indian Ocean in, in 2004. And the Sunday immediately afterwards in, in my church, we were starting to sing, you know, the great praise hymns. And I had a lump in my throat. I could not sing because I was in tears watching you know, these hundreds of thousands of people being drowned in the ocean. And here we are singing the praise. And I want to say, God, why? And, and why can't we just get together on the ground, on the floor of the church and weep with mm -hmm. suffering and pain and say, Lord, please, why do these things happen? Yeah. Why cannot we as evangelical Christians sometimes lament before God? Mm -hmm. You see, I think th this could also be a personal thing. Because in some worship, it seems to me that we almost force people to say and sing things that may well not be what's going on in their heart and refuse them the opportunity to actually be honest before God and say, Lord, I am suffering. I am in pain. I am angry. Please help me. So people are saying things they don't really feel and pretending to feelings that they don't really have. So that's not honest. It's not being honest before God. And I think that's why God has given us some of these psalms. He's why he's given us the book of Job, so many of the uh, laments in the book of Jeremiah. Even Jesus on the cross says, why have you forsaken me? There is something of this biblical theme of being able to, as it were, beat on God's chest and say, Lord, why is this happening? Will you please do something about it? That God says, I know, I hear. God is big enough and strong enough to take our pain and our suffering and our anger and our lament so maybe this friend who's asked this question needs to go to their worship leader or their song leader or their music leader or their pastor and say you know sometimes in our worship we need to do more than just all of this praise let's also give space to the biblical concepts of lament and protest i've written a bit about this in one of the books that i've written called the god i don't understand um, there's a whole section on there on um, evil and suffering in the world and what we should do about it as Christians and how we've neglected the biblical voice of lament. Um, and there's a wonderful 
Asian author called Rico Villanueva from the Philippines. Some of you may know Rico. Uh, and he has written a book called It's Okay to Be Not Okay. Um, and it's actually a book of uh, a kind of commentary on some of the Psalms, on the Lament Psalms particularly. That's Rico Villanueva. It's okay to be not okay. Thank you so much. And we are now, we are nicely at 9.30, but I will end with a last question. Uh, and um, to those who we did not get to answer the questions, I think we know them. I think uh, Reverend Chris also notes them. Perhaps we could look into some of these uh, tomorrow that, would, that could um, guide us in how to go through, uh, do the Q&A. But I'll just end with this final uh, story, which uh, question, in which I think Reverend Chris, you want us to think about is to how do I uh, start to live God's story? How does that look like? How does it uh, look like to even begin patterning our lives or, in, or seeing ourselves as a participant? So seeing ourselves is one thing. How do we go about actually doing this? Well, uh, several quick things. Um, one, read the Bible. <laughs> um, I mean, there is a... There is and has been within the Christian church a tragic loss of serious Bible reading, learning, engaging. Um, and we, we have a few favorite verses, we hear a few sermons, but we never really get into the Bible as a whole. And so that's the first mm -hmm. thing. If you're going to live the Bible story, you have to know the Bible story. Um, and, I, it, and there's no shortcut to that. It, it doesn't somehow get injected into your arm like a vaccine. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we have to live the Bible by uh, daily engagement with it and serious reading and trying to get the whole of it together. The second thing is um, try to put yourself into each part of the story and ask, what difference does it make to my life that I actually am a child of God? I'm made in his image. I'm living in his creation. I've got responsibilities. So what is my created humanity got to do here in my life story? But also I'm radically fallen. I'm a sinner. Um, so how do I bring my fallenness awareness into my humility and, and therefore not become arrogant or think I can just be whatever I want to be, this kind of uh, rather self-centered humanist. But then how do I live within the story of Israel? How do I recognize that uh, what Paul says, that these things were written for our learning, that we actually read the stories of Israel, the laws of the Old Testament, the words of the prophets, and they say, well, now, if I were an Israelite, how do I put myself into their sandals and hear God's word of, of encouragement and of faithfulness and of promise and of command? Uh, how do I live with this God, the God of Jesus, the God who Jesus knew as Abba Father? Let's remember that. Uh, when Jesus talked Abba Father, he was talking to the God that we call the God of the Old Testament, the, the Lord of Israel. And then, of course, equally come through the rest of the story, live in the Gospels, live in the Book of Acts, live into the future and say, how does my life get shaped by knowing these great stories and this great truth? And how do they impact the way I think of myself, my family, my work and my relationships with others, my future, my significance, my identity, my ethnicity? All of these things can, can be impacted by, by bringing the, the light of the Bible story at each of its uh, major events uh, and saying, right, I'm in that story. It's my story. I think that's a way to start. So that concludes our Q&A session. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions, as well as uh, Reverend uh, Christopher Wright uh, for being with us, worshipping with us, and also working through these questions with us. As for our conference participants, we hope that this whets your appetite for more. Come back tomorrow uh, where Reverend Chris will talk about saints in the public square, God and the world of work. And uh, finally, just a note from the organizers that like me to tell you that um, they have sent along a PDF copy uh, of Reverend Chris's Five Marks of Mission. Do check it out, give it a read, and let's talk again tomorrow and let's hear your questions further. I will now pass the time to the MCs. Thank you so much.